Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us on a Google Hangout with uh, Dental Sleep Practice Magazine and Easy Sleep. Tonight we have Dr. Todd Morgan to talk to all of us about the apnea guard. And we also have with us Ryan Dovenbach from uh, National Sales Manager for Easy Sleep. So we can talk to you about how to order the apnea guard and how to get started with the whole program. But Dr. Todd Morgan is here to talk about how he developed the apnea guard and how you can use it in your practice. He's a clinician and researcher with over 25 years of treating sleep medicine patients. Uh, he's sat on the executive board of the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine, lectures nationally and internationally on oral applied therapy. And he's completed several NIH-funded clinical trials, authored several peer review articles, and owns a few patents on all these things. And so he's a, he's a current chief of oral medicine at Scripps Memorial Hospital in Encinitas. Uh, we're... So fortunate to have him work, uh, with us. I've known Todd a long time. He's an excellent educator. We're in for a good uh, lesson here today about uh, apnea guard. And thank you for joining Dental Sleep Practice. And I'll turn it right over to Dr. Morgan. Okay. Hi, Steve. Hello, everyone out there in cyberspace. Um, thanks for the invitation to the webinar. I'm always excited to talk about the apnea guard and how dramatically it's changed the way I practice dental sleep medicine. Um, in our setting today, I think it would be best to go right into a quick background <clears throat> and some slides concerning how we made our discoveries in dental sleep medicine and how those influenced our decisions on the design of the apnea guard. So I think the audience will appreciate how we get through that story today. So right now I'm going to switch right into my, uh, my uh, slides. And... Okay, I hope everyone can see that fine. There we go. So, the story really began for me by identifying the problems that I struggled with back in the Stone Age when I was routinely gluing two night guards together to make a jaw advancement device. And this is what we made right here. And uh, so those were labor-intensive years for me. The first appliance to come along, though, was great. It was the, uh, for me at least, it was the called the Clearway appliance. It was the first one that allowed incremental adjustments of protrusive position based on the high rack screw up here. So this is very familiar to orthodontists, uh, this type of mechanism. And so it was adapted to dental sleep medicine as have other appliances. So that was developed by Dr. Alan Lowe back in the late 90s. And I thought it was great because I didn't have to cut appliances apart anymore and re-acrylic them to uh, change protrusive. But it turns out there was an Achilles heel, and all those adjustments <laughs> that were available to me now was almost like it was challenging. It was like cracking a safe now uh, to find the perfect jaw position. So, and also, having an adjustable oral appliance didn't guarantee either that it would work for any given patient phenotype. So I had struggled with a continuing battle with my physicians who always felt like they were taking a great risk by referring to a patient to me for appliance therapy. Because, you know, it may not work. And they, plus they were expecting that it would work just like CPAP. And we know now that's not a very reasonable expectation. And secondarily, the financial cost to the patient. They were afraid they referred them to me. They, patient would spend money. This is the days before insurance was covering things. And uh, fortunately, that's better now. But they're still physicians are still very concerned about those kind of things. So we're still struggling after all these years to prove ourselves and our outcomes to the physicians. So anyway, let me get to my list of problems. And you know, this, the whole apnea guard uh, journey for me is about solving problems in a way that was validated and scientifically approached. And so I hope when you leave today, you'll see that we worked through all the steps needed to clinically prove and scientifically prove that this would work. Anyway, here's here are my problems. Don't, yeah, first of all, of course, I just said we didn't know if it would work, and I couldn't guarantee a thing to the physicians. Now titration, given a, a adjustable appliance, was tedious, and it also became more expensive as we began using home sleep testing 
to guide our calibration. You know, if you have a uh, set of disposables that you have to deploy each time, and, and you know you don't always get to use the same ones over, you're using those over and over, and you're spending your own money to um, to get that done. And plus, I found that there were more adjustments than ever. I mean, I would cut appliances apart and glue them back together a few times, but now we've got patients coming back for appointments. Too many, actually. And pretty soon, you're spending more time and money, and your return on the investment of time spent goes down. So in the mid-2000s, I teamed up with a company called Advanced Brain Monitoring, and we formed a partnership, a research partnership. And ABM had obtained a large NIH grant through the Institute of Dental and Cranial Facial Research. And our, you know, we, we set out to we'll work together uh, protocols for using home sleep testing in conjunction with the titration of appliances. And uh, so that's what we did. And here are the questions we wanted to answer in our NIH grant. And first of all, who will it work best on? The one tripping point we have still is how do we select patients for oral appliance therapy? So we're trying to uncover back then who are these going to work best on? How much can we help the patient? Often my outcomes were short of, of great. And what can be done to increase our success? So that's where we started back then. So we set out to study outcomes in a cohort of 122 patients. And the appliance selection was divided, as you see here. And I hope you can see my pointer. We had 35 tap appliances, 60 uh, tap tube, 60 tap three, and 27 herps appliances. So a pretty good sized cohort here. And our goal is, of course, how to develop wearing a home sleep testing unit. We call it, we were developing also the Aries Unicorder. And we're doing multiple nice studies, pre-treatment, one month post-treatment and two months. And sometimes we even went three months with some of our studies. And it turns out that, well, hey, doing all these home sleep testing uh, nights and advancing the jaw in incremental amounts really improved my success by 50%. So I was very, very happy with that. But there was one finding in our data that came out and it was, we saw a shift in the success rates between men and women that seem to be related to our change from using the TAP2 and the TAP3 devices. In other words, <clears throat> in our first group of 35 using TAP2, the men did better. And in the second group, the women did better. And we really scratched our heads. We didn't know why that was. Uh, and the change in design from TAP2 to TAP3 was not planned. It was just simply that the TAP2 went out of production, so we had to go with the TAP3. Unfortunately, we were told and thought that there was really, really no significant difference between the designs, so it took us a while to figure this out. <clears throat> the good luck in this unplanned change was that we were able to determine that the change was related to vertical distance between the arches. Okay, so in reality, we didn't hold vertical a constant in our studies. Okay, and so here we can see that the TAP2 has much more vertical than the TAP3. Okay, this is very important. And this is weird because we use the same byte registration technique to make the devices, but because of the play and the length of the hook, we wound up with different verticals in each group, okay? So we were, we were uh, challenged, and in order to prove our hypothesis that the difference in vertical would account for the difference in gender outcomes, we decided to build appliances for 28 randomly selected patients from our cohort, and we brought them in, and so we had titrated 28 patients to optimal endpoint, and then we swapped the design out and change the uh, holding the protrusive setting uh, the same. And then we conducted two more nights of home sleep testing, and we found the increased VDO helped to reduce the AHI in men, but not in women, and the reverse also held true, as you can see here. So when we increase the vertical from 
uh, to 10 BDO. Okay, 10 of the patients approved, six no change. Uh, females, nobody improved, no change or worse. Okay, so our, our conclusion was from this study that females should start with less vertical, five to seven millimeters in females and 10 in males. Okay, so that was, that took us a while to figure out. It was kind of cool that we actually did figure it out. So now I'm a believer in vertical, right? Now, just to finish things up from our study, we also looked at different designs, right? So we looked at the TAP versus the Herbst, and also we learned that it, it makes a difference on the preferred sleep position, okay? So the Herbst, of course, with these arms, everyone that's used this know there's lots of lateral play in this design, okay? With the TAP, we're relatively confined to a small amount of side-to-side -side difference, okay? And so we call this stabilized and this not stabilized in terms of lateral movement. So we looked at the difference between these two designs and we found that in the supine position it didn't make a whole lot of difference which design you chose, whether it was stabilized or not stabilized. But in the non-supine group we found surprisingly that over months, even though we got a nice decrease, it wasn't consistent and the non-stabilized group, the Herbst appliance group, had worse outcomes. Okay, so now we've got a hypothesis that well, if someone prefers to sleep on their side, sorry, let's go back. If someone prefers to sleep on their side, maybe we should have a design that stabilizes lateral movement. Now you can hypothesize any way you like about why this occurs, but this is what we found. <clears throat> Okay, now we'll go right into uh, bite registration techniques. So what's available out there to us? Um, there's many bite registration techniques, and this is just three of them. Uh, the functional is often called the phonetic bite. Um, so really, these are the main three that I've seen out there, and now we developed the apnea guard. So this is a short list. But one of the most consistent frustrations I hear from my students is, where should I put the bite? I heard this for years and years. <clears throat> and as we're going to show you as we go through the show here, only the apnea guard bite registration protocol is validated scientifically. And that's why it is almost without exception what I use routinely in my practice. And friends, this is mainly why we're here today to talk about the apnea guard. And briefly why we, how we incorporate all our research findings into the design of the device. So let's take a look at the George Gage device for a moment. And this was, this was an awesome development uh, more than 20 years ago by Dr. Peter George, an orthodontist out of Hawaii. It's simple. It's repeatable. It only takes a few minutes. And I used this for many years, and honestly, when we developed the Abney Guard, we borrowed some elements of this because fortunately Peter's patent had expired. So we took advantage of that. Um, and really what we're looking at with the Abney Guard, with the, pardon me, George Gage is retrusive, neutral, some might call this position, protrusive, okay, and we're watching a reading on a scale here in the changes. And then we're locking it in at 60% and doing a bite registration at that at that position. Okay, so the apnea guard, uh, uh, pardon me, the George Gage records range of motion in neutral protrusive and makes it a, easy to determine 60%. Very cool. But there was one thing missing in our minds, and that was what about vertical? There were a limited amount of choices. You got a three to five millimeter. Uh, choice of vertical with the tabs on the George gauge. So for the Abney Guard, we developed a very similar sliding tab system. Okay, the upper has a tab on it, and the lower has a receiver, as you see here. And as the upper, as they slide against each other, you can read the range of motion and record it. Um, and so we decided to make our calculations at 70% for reasons that I'll go into a little bit later. But the Abney Guard is ideal temporary titration appliance because you can wear this. You can wear this out of the office for immediate protection against drowsiness 
or a risk to the patient. And it is FDA cleared, and I believe that this is the only trial appliance that has the FDA clearance for use for 30 days or 30 nights. Um, why did we do 30 nights? Uh, people asked me, and I said, well, it's only because we don't want people to think this is a permanent appliance. And someone comes back and they said, hey, the liner came out. Can you refit it? And I said, no, sir, no, ma'am. This is only approved by the FDA for 30 days. So it, it prohibits us from not going to the custom, if you will. Okay? And it is adjustable by one millimeter increments. So based on our clinical evidence and our clinical needs, my clinical needs, we named these as the salient features of the apnea garden. We wanted to control the vertical dimension. We feel this is very important. We wanted lateral stability. Okay, and this appliance certainly has that. We want precise, precise protrusive measurements. We want it to be repeatable, simple protocols that an auxiliary can do in your office or even a sleep tech in a, in a sleep lab. And we want a direct transfer of the bite registration to the laboratory fabrication of the custom appliance. So this design is what we selected. It has some relief here with slits. It expands to accommodate a wide uh, range of arches. It won't fit everybody, of course, but there are three vertical dimensions and 5.5 low, 6.5 moderate, medium, and eight millimeters for high. Fitting the apnea guard is really quick and easy. Um, there's a YouTube video that will show you uh, how to fit this. It should take 10 minutes or less. We said 15 because if, if you're really slow, it might take that long. But there is a systematic way to fit the trays with PVS putty. And this is heavy body PVS. Why? Because we don't want the two uh, mixes on the upper and lower trays to come together and lock the appliance together. We also came up with a scoop that precisely measures the amount that will be used so that it doesn't spill over the sides too much. So that was part of the development too. So what about tray height selection? Okay, so we wanted, it's very important to us to select the correct vertical dimension. So we came up with a quick protocol to do that. So tray height or vertical dimension between the incisors, a lot of people call this VDL, but it's really between the incisors, determined by gender and tongue size. Okay, all right, cool. Well, females, we know need less vertical, right? So we start with the low, 5.5, for anyone who's, uh, for normals, and then medium, if we see what I call BFT, uh, big fat tongue, with great admiration and respect, but scalp tongues are going to need more room, so we bump them up to the medium. Men start with a higher vertical, a medium, and then go to the high for a scalp tongue. So this is a very simple algorithm we, we developed for choosing the correct vertical dimension. So if we look at a quick summary of how to use the apnea guard, okay, and we want to make tonight's uh, webinar eff very efficient. Validated bite registration protocol for optimizing dental seat medicine, okay? Number one, select the auto optimum vertical height, fit it, and determine the range of motion measures. <clears throat> and then step two, we have a, a, a quick and easy guide to calculate the correct protrusive setting. In this case, it's 13, so the patient started at 7 on the scale and pushed out to 15. And so those numbers are recorded on the, on the front tab, and 70% would be 13 here. So that makes the math a little bit easier uh, for everyone. And then, of course, you can either have the choice, send the apnea guard, the whole apnea guard, into the lab to articulate the models, okay? Or there's a second choice, and this is a very important point about the apnea guard. Often we want to provide immediate treatment a therapeutic benefit for patients that are sleeping. So in my practice, if someone has a F-worth score of 10 or more, they are uh, defined as sleepy, and we will then 
pull the tabs out, the PBS putty, out of the trays and send in the measurements. Let me show you how that works real quick on this next slide. So the dentist is going to record the settings, pull the tabs out, and then we refit new PBS putty so the patient can use that for the next 30 days while they're waiting for their custom appliance. There's two benefits mainly to this. One is if they're sleepy, they're treated, just like we've always envied about CPAP, where the patient can leave that morning with effective treatment in a CPAP machine. Now we have a choice and we can give the patient effective treatment immediately leaving our office. This was extremely important to me because that was a constant uh, argument point between the physicians and I. I said, well, how long will it take to make the appliance? I don't know, one or two months, maybe titrating, you know, three months before the patient is going to be adequately treated. And so that this overcomes that argument right, right here. All you have to do, and I don't think you can see this, but you just write down the settings, the uh, protrusive of 13, the tray height you used, and send the models. And the lab will then use a laboratory version of the apnea guard, a jig, inserts the PVS putty inserts into that, and now they have the same exact protrusive and vertical settings that were existing in the original apnea guard. So this is how we transfer the, uh, the settings of the apnea guard over. Oh, here's a close-up. I forgot I put this in. So please fabricate herbs using the apnea guard setting high, trace height was high at 14 millimeters protrusion. <clears throat> so now we want to know how well does this work? How well would the apnea guard settings work to treat sleep apnea? And so we set out to um, do a study, okay? And so we published this in 2011. Uh, Dan Lewandowski, my close friend and partner, we did this together and the objective of the study was to assess the treatment efficacy of a novel titration appliance with that of a customized oral appliance. Okay, so basically we want to see will the apnea guard perform as well as a custom appliance. Okay, 17 patients. And here's our, here's our results. So essentially in those patients we were able to show that the apnea index in this slide goes down. Overall, apnea index goes down, and these are not significant differences. In the supine, we actually outdid, the apnea guard outdid the custom appliance in the supine position. Okay? And the non-supine were about equal. And these are very strong uh, confidence intervals here. And the same thing over here, AHI 4% going down, okay? So we were very, very pleased that the pilot study showed that the apnea guard set at 70% with similar efficacy to the custom appliance. Okay, so now that we know the apnea guard works with equivalence to custom appliances, how will the apnea guard protocol compare, uh, perform in comparison to the traditional bite registration? Okay, so this is the next step we're going to take. So and then we publish this, which is a comparison of mandibular reposition device for OSA using alternate approach for determining optimal jaw forward position. Okay, and these are our these are our hardworking researchers right here. Alicia's in the room with me here right now. Victoria's a good friend, Dan. So what we did here was we have uh, method A, and basically we retrospectively looked into my charts years back and we using the, the George gauge we wanted to know how long did it take to treat a patient out how long did it take to reach optimal protrusion titration position okay and we looked at uh, 28 charts and then we decided okay let's initiate 23 new patients going forward prospectively and we said let's use the apnea guard in those patients using our standard protocols and then we'll see what the differences are. How fast do we treat them out and how well? Well, as you might guess, the results were similar, but the biggest finding we had of all was a difference in treatment time. 
Okay, with the old style titration with the George gauge, it took me 136 days to reach optimal titration, and now it's 33. Amazing, amazing. So we saved ourselves 100 days and at least two or three appointments to reach the optimal titration with the Abney Guard. Now, let me let me throw out a, a concern because I I was very concerned that throwing someone out to the optimal treatment position at 70% would set up a lot of problems for the jaws, muscles, teeth. Uh, quite cr contrary to that, what we found, or what I found clinically, is the appliance became comfortably comfortable immediately. And if you look at some of the literature from Isono and others looking at the passive pharynx and passive muscle function, and this is in relation to nocturnal bruxism, if you have a passive airway muscles relax, and I think this is the key to getting someone very comfortable very quickly, is using a technique that will get them to the proper vertical and protrusion quickly and reduce the time it takes to titrate the appliance. So, and this is an important point, of course, we're not difference, uh, there's no difference between the two groups in terms of the, uh, the outcome. Okay, so let's, let's do a summary here. Apnea guard settings improve outcomes of a custom appliance. So here's, here's our data, okay? Outcomes from custom appliance after insertion to apnea guard settings, and then outcomes according to conventional protocols. So you can get the impression right here easily that it works better using the apnea guard system. And here's the key right here. If you're, if you're concerned like I am about how, how long it will take and using overhead time to get these things titrated out, it's going to save you a lot of time and money. So what's the take home here? And I'm going to wrap it up here, Steve. Okay. Some design features matter. Okay, we talked about lateral stability. I, I think that matters. Um, you can certainly take an appliance like a Herbst and put elastics on it and reduce lateral uh, uh, range. Uh, and I think that might help if someone actually thinks about that and they're wondering if how they can improve mm -hmm. the results of the Herbst. Add elastics. Vertical can matter. I think it can matter in like anything else in science, we have our study that shows a, a good outcome and some indication that it will be helpful in some patients. Okay? Does the gender difference matter? I think it does, and in all my years of practice, I've seen this to be true over and over again clinically. But clinically, it doesn't matter as much as scientifically, so I hope you can appreciate the work we did to prove this. Uh, in previous studies, um, you'll hear a lot of people poo-poo um, vertical uh, where based on Peter Sestouli's study. Uh, I'm not sure what year it was, but it was long ago, and he added 15 millimeters of vertical. Of course, I believe that's too much. That's twice as much as what we use, and it probably rotates the tongue back. The, uh, the third thing is you can go directly to go. Go is like, let's go out there and treat you right to the predicted position. Save time, save money, and save the patient a lot of pain and suffering. Okay? And you do have a way to predict who will respond to an oral appliance prior to making the custom. Because the apnea guard is equivalent in outcomes to the custom, you can actually make one, test the patient with it, and you will know whether or not a uh, custom appliance is going to work. So in those cases where you need to prove it before you do it, the apnea guard will do that for you. And uh, I, I don't have to do that too often, but it does come in handy. So I'm going to switch back over. And I want to take any questions. God, there was a question earlier, and I think you answered, but I'd like for you to kind of just state that again. And that is, the uh, questioner said, well, if you have someone with severe apnea, can you, how can you predict whether the custom appliance will work? And I think I saw in that data that you had some severe apnea patients in there, didn't you? We did. We did have severe patients. Can you see me here? Yes. Okay. Um, we had a mix of mild, moderate, and severe in our cohort. And so um, the apnea guard works just as well in mild, moderate, severe to predict outcomes. 
uh, and so there's no need to worry about that. We know that severes aren't going to treat out as well, but we're looking for the response, and in my hands at least, Steve, I feel like I can manipulate the, the devices a little bit better even after the apnea guard has shown a response and maybe he got a little better result from that. Um, so I'm not afraid to treat severe. Well, so I, we know sometimes when the patients are in our office and they have severe sleep apnea and they've uh, turned down using CPAP, there isn't a lot of other choices they have, but it seems like using something like an apnea guard would give them confidence that uh, they could try something else you know, when they've had a, a, a previous uh, therapeutic failure and uh, try something else without having to invest a lot of money or trouble. Well, certainly that that is a great tool to offer to your physician. So, um, and since lab t sleep techs can fit the apnea guards, they can actually do a split night in one model that we developed with the apnea guard to determine efficacy prior to sending the patient to you. So, they can send them to you, you can place the apnea guard, do an oximetry or some simple procedure. Hey, I've got a responder. Prove to the physician that you've got a legitimate chance of making oral appliance work in these severe patients. If the, and I, like I said, I understand the struggle. <laughs> I understand the struggle with physicians improving what we can do. Mm -hmm. But you've got to give these patients a chance if they can't use CPAP. Right. Anything we can do to build an a optimal outcome is good. Now, one thing I'd like for you to talk about is, you know, I see patients and I, I do the examination, I take the impressions and I send them off. I have a certain amount of expense to do that. But if I use an apnea guard, aren't I adding more to my expense? Can we, can we bill that to insurance companies? Is it worth it? Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, if you're, if you're savvy to medical insurance coding, you know there is a code for a trial appliance, but very few carriers are paying for that. Uh, we're working on that. So, uh, but for now, uh, the Abney Guard actually there's a program uh, for distribution through a company called Easy Sleep, and we're going to have Ryan Jababa. <laughs> Did I say your name right? right. Um, hey, however you want to make it work, Doctor Morgan. That's perfect. <laughs> so, um, so we're going to have Ryan come on and talk about Easy Sleep has an exclusive with the Apnea Guard, and they have a, a some kind of program where they can offer it for free to dentists who want to use it in conjunction with their sleep testing. So it basically shouldn't cost much of anything to do this. Well, very good, yeah, because and I think in your study you showed that with fewer visits to the office, it actually saves money anyway when you have a patient getting that fast treatment like you said. So there's a number of, of uh, pluses for using the Apnea Guard. Well, I'll give you a little uh, inside information, and that is that we're trying with a local managed care group, and they are paying the trial appliance code in order to weed out the non-responders and wow. pay for customs. So that don't that business model is under development, but and I'm going to be happy to share that next time around with you guys. But what is true right now is that Easy Sleep has a program that we that uh, doctors can get involved in right away. And that's what Ryan's here to talk about. And, and uh, if you're watching this video, you can scroll down your screen. You'll see some contact information for Ryan Javenbach. And so you can get some accurate information about Easy Sleep. And there's actually also a uh, questionnaire and uh, uh, other documents you can download. So you, you and your office can have some real good data. So, Ryan, you want to talk a little bit about the program of Easy Sleep? Yeah, absolutely. And, and and just to go off your question there, Dr. Carstensen, that you were speaking about that Dr. Morgan was jumping in on, um, number one, there are multiple different programs. Uh, we'd be more than happy to talk about those offline. However, when, when Dr. Morgan was speaking about the fact that there is a program for unlimited amounts of these, there is a program that we call Love at First Bite. And that is something that our doctors would get involved in as an Easy Sleep member. Um, and that being said, to go ahead and get involved with that, um, you know, it, it really comes down to the fact that what we do is provide your patients with the apnea guard service and the device itself. So anybody diagnosed, well, first of all, tested, but also diagnosed with apnea with the Easy Sleep program um, would technically get two apnea guards that someone like Dr. Todd Morgan uses, um, and anybody else can do that as well. And I'd be more than happy to talk about that offline. 
Um, but you can also go through the process of ordering a la carte. Uh, as Dr. Morgan mentioned, we are the exclusive provider of this amazing pr product that he and Dan Levinowski have put together. Uh, we're excited about this. This is going to physically change really the way you guys, as the DDS, DMD, et cetera, treat patients. I think it comes down to, number one, leading clinically, finding that great, perfect bite, but also minimizing that chair time, sending that piece right off to, to the lab, whoever you use, to really get that patient's, uh, like you said, doctor, in your study, you know, decreasing that chair time, increasing your productivity, it's a win-win for everybody. So again, our starter kits for the Apnea Guard program, uh, you can buy a box of five of those for 250 bucks. That's fine. But in my mind, depending on how active, if you're a, a heavy user like Dr. Todd Morgan, we do have some other monthly service programs that can fit your needs and actually save you on your overall cost. Um, as opposed to buying those directly. So I think it's a win-win for everybody on this call. And if anybody has further questions, thoughts, I'm more than happy to take those calls, emails, or text messages with my phone and email there provided for all of you guys. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. I really, we really appreciate this. I got some more questions coming in from our viewers here, Todd. Okay. Uh, are you waiting till the end of the 30 days to order the custom appliance after you make the apnea guard? Okay, so... Well, no. Actually, what we do is routinely on our on our intake exam and then the workup where we do the impressions and the bite registration. We use the apnea guard, and I again I said if the patient is drowsy or tired, um, and the upward, you know, that's sort of a standard of, you know, that I we use. But if someone, if we feel like they need treatment right away, we'll refit and send them home with the apnea guard. And uh, that also has the benefit. I, I think I don't think I mentioned that it gets them used to wearing an oral appliance. And you know these trial appliances aren't they're a little bulky, you know, but they do the job. But then they look at the custom and they go like, "Wow, this is great!" And so they're really really ready to, and they're easy to adapt into the custom. So um, the question is like, no, we we we. Use we send them out with the Abney Guard, and the day that they receive it, some of them, if they're in this new program, will be tested the first night they leave with the Abney Guard to show efficacy. So it, you know, you might say it's it's similar to other uh, devices that you can test overnight and know whether or not they respond to jaw protrusion as a treatment. But um, that can be used that way. It can be also be used to show the patient that it's working or the physician. So no, we, we don't wait. We just go ahead and fabricate the custom right away and get it going because the apnea guard is only going to be good for 30 days. And then we've got to get the custom in before that time expires. So you sent them out with 70% protrusion. Have you had anybody that comes back and say that's too much, but they, they would actually respond at less than 70%? Yeah, sure. There are some, and we give the patient the option because it's adjustable, of course. We show them how to set the jaw back one or two millimeters, and what we do in our practice very quickly is we have them wear it for 10 minutes or so. They're real comfortable. It's 70% boom. If they're not, we back it up 50 uh, to 60 or so and, uh, or less, a little bit less, and then we ask them to advance into 70 before they return because their custom is going to come in at 70 percent and often by that time their jaws are conditioned to receive the custom at 70. So that answered actually another question because the, the uh, uh, viewer said do you wait until you have tested it before you take the bite registration and you kind of do because you send the appliance out the, the, to the laboratory but then you wait until they come back and then you can send that liner part of the apnea guardian for that mounting, correct? Right. That's yeah. Exactly. yeah, so so they get a chance to, to kind of prove it's right. And if you want to, you can actually have a test run, an actual home sleep test or a, or a PSG run, just to verify, but even before you have the custom one done. That's right. And so we have that option available. And like what I was saying, the other model that we're developing is let's let's weed out folks that don't respond right away. And that's, that's the basis for these insurance companies saying, yes, we'll pay the trial clients go. Now, with the apnea guard kit, somebody asked, well, what comes with the kit? Is that little chart that you showed about protrusion, is that in the kit? Oh, yeah. The, the kit has actually the putty and 
we we chose a PBS putty that has the right hardness quotient to it. Um, the scoops put just the right amount into the trays so you don't have spillover. So you got the Abney Guard, the putty, the scoops, and then the the little card. Even though I like to think I can calculate sixty or seventy percent, it's just easy to to run to that number. So it just it makes it kind of a really easy. And so more importantly, you know, we want this to be a a uh, auxiliary procedure. Oh, the dentist should not be doing this. I mean, sure, do the first 10, and then you can just tell your assistants how to do it. But the assistants or the sick tech can do this for you. Yeah. Uh, we've had a couple of comments uh, talking about how much they enjoy working with the uh, apnea guard. They've tried it in their practice, and they think it's really fantastic. So they wanted to pass along big thank yous for uh, creating this tool uh, for us to have in our practices. Uh, so you can actually use it a number of different ways. You could uh, you could have the patient go home with it for a week and then come back and, and tell them how you did or test it. You can send them just send them home for thirty days and then, uh, make up that that seventy percent. Lots of ways, right? Yeah, you know one one a couple of quick uh, quick stories. The first few times that I tried to just use it and say go home and try it, um, patients didn't come back. They just thought it's working great. I don't need to go back. And uh, so now I'm a little bit more careful, and we try and get the impressions for the custom on that day because then they're going to come back and get the custom. But I kind of jokingly said earlier that patients will come back and say, well, hey, we can refit this because yeah. it's working fine. So you don't want to get in fall into that boat. But So qualify if you're going to try it. Like this is strictly a trial appliance, and it's not FDA approved for more than one month. Okay. Well, Dr. Morgan, I want to thank you for a really uh, fun webinar here, and thank you, Ryan, for helping sponsor this. And, and the readers, don't forget to uh, scroll down and get that contact information so you can get a hold of Easy Sleep. And this issue of uh, Dental Sleep Practice, the winter issue, has a whole article of that was written by Todd and the Ryan from Easy Sleep and others, and so there's a lot of information out there. Thank you for being a part of another webinar from Dental Sleep Practice Magazine, and uh, we'll say good night. Good night, everyone. Night, guys.